I titled this sermon today, Don't Let Go. She was four years old, shivering in the water near the shore. Not because she was cold, but she was fearful. She was about to do something she had never, ever done before. And she didn't know whether she wanted to do it at all. She did, and yet she didn't. Well, she lay back in my arms with her little life jacket on, her little Snoopy skis on her feet, and she had her legs pulled up to her chest like I told her, and I had my arms wrapped around her gently and lovingly. She was holding onto the rope, and at the other end of the rope was the boat with Michelle driving it. She probably knew this was going to happen because her brother had learned to do this three years before, and she had seen him water skiing. But as I held her, I saw little tears forming in her eyes, and I held her gently to her and tried to encourage her, held her in position, and I yelled, hit it. Well, the engine engaged, and the rope was tight, and she started up, and it's just she started to rise out of the water, and she let go of the rope. <laughs> And Michelle turned the boat around, came back, got the rope, set it all up again, and said, hit it, and she let go of the rope. <laughs> After a dozen or more times of this, I could uh, tell what was, she was thinking in her mind, her little voice. She said, Daddy, how many times do I have to do this? <laughs> <laughs> and she just figured that if she did enough times that she'd be able to quit. <clears throat> that was what she was thinking. I could see that. So I told her, I said, Crystal, I said, if you keep just letting go of the rope, we'll be out here all day. <laughs> I said, if you actually hang on to the rope and go up, if you fall, let go. But if you don't fall, don't let go. <laughs> How many times in our life do we see a task in front of us that's daunting, that we think we can't handle, some trial, some circumstance, some health issue perhaps, a job issue, that we don't think we can handle it, and we kind of let go of the rope. We let go. Do we have the faith that the one who's guiding us in our Christian pursuit knows what we can and we can't do? Little Crystal didn't trust herself. She probably didn't trust me <laughs> totally either in this. And she probably asked herself, why was I making her do this, especially at such a young age? But before you think I'm an ogre, <laughs> This actually was a long time in coming. We lived, when we moved to Texas, when the college uh, came together, when they closed Pasadena and moved to Texas, we bought a house on the lake. And the house had a swimming pool, as well as the, uh, us having the lake. And this, I'd been preparing her for a couple of years already, actually, for this actual moment. She had learned to swim before she was two years old. And at age four, she was a pretty accomplished swimmer for her age. She would run and, and play. She'd jump off the diving board, she'd go down the slide, she'd do wild things with her brother, who was three years older. And water skiing would probably be easier for her than jumping off the diving board, sliding down that slide. I'd also, in the intervening year, put her on my skis and held her and said, hit it. And so she had gone around the lake, standing on my skis. I actually had a second rope I gave it so she could hold onto the rope as well and feel that. And for her fear of falling in the water, I would actually let go at times, and we'd sink in the water. And we'd get up again, I'd let go, and we'd sink in the water. And let her realize that we were going about 20 miles an hour, which is what you needed to go at least that, because our two weights combined were about 200 pounds. I was about 170, and she was 30. So I knew that when she started to ski, it wouldn't take any power at all to get her up. I mean, she could, she could ski in neutral. <laughs> <laughs> practically. In fact, I remember once she said that, you're going too fast. And we were, I said, that's just the wind blowing us. We're in neutral. <laughs> but, uh, but it was interesting because I knew it wouldn't be that hard. If she fell, it wouldn't be anything at all for her. And so I had been preparing her all this time. And she'd be going a lot slower than she had gone with me. I truly had prepared her for what she was going to do. But she didn't know it. She didn't realize all those things going up to that. It was preparing her for the next phase of what she would do. She didn't realize the end goal that I wanted her to have, to build her self-esteem, to be able to do something that others couldn't do and gain some confidence in her abilities at a young age so she would try other things. She was ready. 
She didn't think she could do it, but she could. I believe God works with us in the same way. After all, He's building a family as well. He's teaching His family, teaching us what He wants us to know. Christ, when He left, said He was going to prepare a place for the apostles and for all those of us who learn by them through God's Word. God knows what his short-term goals and his long-term goals are for you and for me. And we don't always know what he is doing or why he's doing it. But he's the one in control and he sets those events in our lives to make us do what he wants and to learn what he wants. We read famous characters in the Bible and we're told those are examples for us. I'd like to go to, to one of those today and kind of carry a story flow through for you because when I was young, I always thought kind of, well, those were the, the old days. and God worked with them in the old days. In the old days, God did all these things, but he doesn't do them today. But he does. He does the same thing in different ways with different people. Turn to Genesis chapter 15, if you would. Start with Abraham. Father of the faithful. He had his weaknesses and his problems, just as all of us do. But it was interesting that God gave him some knowledge of what was going to happen. He made promises to him. He told him to leave early Chaldees, which he did. He told him he would have a son and a multitude of children and things. And, uh, and yet his wife was barren. Genesis 15, verse 12. It says, When the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And lo, a horror of great darkness fell on him. And he said to Abram, Know of a surety that your seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and surely they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they serve will I judge, and afterwards shall they come out with great substance. Four hundred years before this would happen, God told Abraham what would befall his descendants the ones he didn't have <laughs> yet. And they were going to be, I mean, to be slaves, you'd think there'd be a lot of people. But yet he started out so small. And so if we look at the incredible events that God caused for this to come to pass, the events that he put through, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, on down, to make this all happen. Incredible trials. Why? To show the glory of God which is really what each of us go through our trials is to show God's glory, what he can do, not what we can do. Those involved would only have a glimpse of what was to come without knowing the who, the what, or the why. God doesn't always explain everything in detail. That's something that we tend to look back on and figure out. And even then, we don't always figure that. But he lets us play a part in it. He lets us choose things. So Abraham and Sarah who waited decades to have a child were told here that their descendants would be slaves in another country. Didn't say where. Didn't say exactly when it would take place. But they'd be there. What events could possibly move them out of the promised land that God had given them? Abraham was very wealthy. How many of you know wealthy people that become slaves? <laughs> <laughs> that generally doesn't work that way. We all face downing tasks in our lives. And so I ask you, as I've asked myself, are these random or are these for a purpose? And how do we handle them? Abraham had those promises, promises unfulfilled for decades. He and Sarah were going to have massive descendants. That's what God told them. They tried to solve the problem themselves with Hagar and Ishmael. And I found that when I try to solve a problem myself, <laughs> you know, I end up with an Ishmael too. <laughs> Not literally, <laughs> but, uh, but when you, you try to do it on your own, it doesn't work. Waiting for God to make things work and to see what he has in store afterwards is what's important. God chose him to give one child a promise. And he and Sarah eventually did conceive Isaac. When we hear or think we hear what God wants, sometimes we decide to accomplish it. Just like 
Abraham did with Hagar. Turn to Genesis 22, verse 11. Again, when we decide how to accomplish it, that's not usually how God works. And he works with what we choose sometimes, but he'll straighten us out. He'll move us around. He'll set up the events and give us a chance to prove him that he's God. Genesis 22, verse 11. The angel of the Lord called from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. Again, this is Abraham about to offer his son Isaac. He has to do something that, that almost no one can live up to. And if I had, God asked me to offer my son, it's a different world, different time, different place than it was back then, but still to have to give up your son is a hard thing. Verse 12, he said, Lay not your hand upon the lad, neither do anything to him, for I know now that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Like God the Father with Christ. Only Christ had to die, but Isaac didn't. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. Behold, a ram caught in the thicket by the horns. And Abraham went and took the ram, offered him up for a burnt offering instead of his son. God supplied the actual sacrifice. He still wanted a sacrifice. They let him use a ram. God decides how and when to make a way of escape. We're going to go back to Genesis, but we're going to turn to 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11 through 13. God has a way of escape for us so that we can prove him. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11. All these things happen to them for examples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. These stories are for us. I often tell my students in ABC, the only thing that got me through life, the different temptations and trials and tribulations and things that have happened to me were these stories. There's always a story of somebody who had some situation similar to what you're in. One of the things I did, Mr. Armstrong, when he made me his aide, I turned him down three times, three weeks in a row, the third time he said, I'm not, telling, I'm not asking you, I'm telling you. So I uh, ended up doing the job, but I, I'd prayed. I just, I went through all the stories of the servants in the Bible, what they had to go through, because I knew I was going to go through some things. Just that's just the way things work. Every servant in the Bible did go through things. And I read Abraham's servant. I thought that was one of the toughest ones, buying a, or finding a wife for your future boss. I thought that'd be a no-win situation. <laughs> but uh, you know, and how did he come about doing that by the well? And and uh, and uh, Elisha's servant who went after the goods and got leprosy. I don't want to do that. And uh, you know, I went through them all because I knew I, I'd be in situations where it would take some wisdom. And those stories got me through. And those examples do make a difference. Verse 12. Wherefore let him that thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. If you decide to do it yourself, you will fall. You'll get your Ishmael. Verse 13, though. There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. He will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able. But with that temptation will make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Don't let go. God will help you bear it. It's only when we let go that we fail. And God brings us around through repentance and things. We can do it again. Abraham did not have to sacrifice his son, but he was willing to obey. And God saw that. <coughs> so Abraham and Sarah had Isaac now that's not a big start for multiplication <laughs> one son and then Isaac had two sons now at this rate in 400 years you'd probably be up to around 200 <laughs> if you only start with a couple at a time and it was through Jacob that God was going to continue the promises Isaac favored Esau, the hunter, the not wild, strong man. Rebecca favored Jacob, the softer one. And that was wrong. Shouldn't have happened. But that happens sometimes in families, even families in other <coughs> God's plan. But God had to teach Jacob a few things because Jacob had taken the birthright by offering a bowl of soup to his hungry brother. Now, he should have given him the soup free. That's what you normally would do. He'd help feed the hungry. That's what Christ had to do. Well, he wanted something back for it. The birthright. Of course, he's 
he thought despised it by what's the birthright worth if I'm dead? And he's right, but he really wasn't going to die. I mean, he just thought he was. And then with his mom in collusion, he stole the blessing. He shouldn't have done that as well. Again, doing things their own way, which forced Jacob to have to flee and go to where his wife's family was from, to Laban. And God often works with what we do, right or wrong, to bring us where he wants us to be. Could have happened a different way, but that was the way it was. With, the Jake, with Jacob, the promise seemed to play a little more, began to grow. Through the deceit, Laban played on Jacob. He ended up with two wives, one he didn't want and one he really loved. Again, causing problems. There's a lesson we should all learn that you reap what you sow. And God let him get a taste of what it's like to be deceived. Through the two wives and their handmaids, he had 12 sons. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Gad, Issachar, and Apollai, as Ebulun. Joseph, and Benjamin. Hey, getting a little bigger now. We're 100 years down the road, but there's still not a whole lot of them, and they're still wealthy. How's that promise come to play, and do they really believe it? Hard to say. The wife Jacob loved most was Rachel, and she had two sons, Joseph and Benjamin. Two he favored. Again, something parents should not do, favoring one son over another. But yet he did. But God usually takes care of these things. God made Esau fairly wealthy as well, so he wouldn't be have hatred and animosity toward his brother. When Joseph came, when Jacob came back, he was afraid he would be, be killed by his brother. So God, I'm sure, blessed Esau. And Isaac did give a blessing on Esau as well. But Esau didn't really believe these promises the same way. And so, but God took care of it so that Jacob wouldn't be destroyed, even through the mistakes he made. This favoritism, though, apparently kept Joseph close to Jacob. Gave him a little more of the counting for the sheep, not simply just a shepherd in the field like his brothers all the time. This would give a preparation to Joseph that God would use later on. Joseph had dreams. We read about those dreams, Genesis 37. I'll turn there next. God was working with him. But again, Joseph didn't really know how that would work out. Genesis 37, we'll read in verse 2 to start with. It did make his brothers jealous and his father even to rebuke him. These, verse 2, Genesis 37, these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Billa, with the sons of Zilpah, his, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Apparently they were doing something in the land they shouldn't have. I'm not sure what. Whether it was with the sheep or with the people. Verse 3, it says, Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age. It's a hundred plus years at this time. Again, past the 400 year promise. And he made him a coat of many colors. So the favoritism showed there. In verse 4, when his brothers saw their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him, and they could not speak peaceably to him. And then Joseph dreamed a dream and told it to his brethren, and they hated him for it. Yet the more. Verse 6, he said to them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheep arose and stood upright, and behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheep. <laughs> Oh, little little gas on the fire here. And again, why did he even tell them? Why did God give him these dreams? His brother said, Shall you indeed reign over us? Shall indeed you have dominion over us? And they hated him yet more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed another dream, verse 9. Told his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars bowed down to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. His father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to you, to the earth? His father knew what the dream meant. Verse 11, his brethren envied him. But his father observed the same. 
because his father had had some dreams too. And he observed it. It didn't make sense. Yeah, they were going to be slaves in another 300 years or whatever, but he knew some of those stories, but Joseph, a father bowing down to a son, that didn't make sense. Joseph was being prepared, but for what? He didn't know. Even his father made it clear what the dream meant, and it didn't make sense. They knew what Joseph was saying. Was it random? Next step, Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. The jealousy, the hatred, and again, these dreams made his brothers more angry at Joseph. Now, if God was favoring, and if I'm favoring someone, I don't do things to them that make other people angry at them. God gave these dreams to him that made his brothers so angry they were willing to kill him. And then one brother, Reuben, says, no, no, let's just sell him. You know. But these dreams that God gave him, God was setting the stage. You know, if God makes my life miserable, I generally don't think it's because he likes me. <laughs> but yet there's something in there that he's doing sometimes. He didn't see it. Joseph didn't see it. But yet God gave those dreams to him. And he was being prepared for something. He didn't know. So Joseph was sold, and he's wondering, how could this be good? Then he goes to Egypt. Was it random? He was sold to Potiphar, one of the wealthy men in Egypt. Joseph's training from his father, his accounting, various things could be put to use. And Potiphar recognized that Joseph was educated and would be able to do things, so he put him over his whole house. And it seems like that was a good thing, yet that wouldn't really fulfill the dreams that his grandfather, great-grandfather had had. He, he was wondering probably, what's going on? Why? What purpose does God have in sending him into slavery? You know, all of our Cinderella stories have him, you know, <laughs> finding the slipper and their queen or king or whatever. It, most of those Cinderella stories aren't in slavery. But all the while that Joseph was there, he remembered God. Joseph did have a connection to his father and grandfather, his great-grandfather, to God and these dreams. But yet he's got to be wondering during these dreams, what is God doing? He didn't know why, but he didn't let go. He didn't say, okay, God, you've deserted me, I'm deserting you. I've heard people say that to me. Well, God didn't help me here, so I'm through with this. I'm through with religion, sadly. Certainly God was blessing him, but then <laughs> Potiphar's wife lies about him, says that, that he tried to rape her, and he gets put in prison. <coughs> How does that fit into this plan? Joseph has to wonder. Tells the truth, and yet he's put in prison. Why didn't God just reveal the truth so Joseph would be spared? That's, you know, as a little kid, I was told, tell the truth and everything will work out. Hey, he tells the truth and he's thrown in prison. Didn't work out. Certainly, God sh should be fair. In prison, God again gave him favor. He basically ran the jail while he was in there because they saw that he was a good guy and knew what he was doing. And he could take some of the workload off the guards and things. And again, his skills were honed in probably the most unforgiving of circumstances in prison. Many would give up on God. But again, Joseph didn't let go. Through the dreams of the butler and the baker, and we read about those, he foretells the dream and they both promise that the one that's freed, hey, tell the Pharaoh I'm in, down here and I interpret this for you in the hope that he'd get out of prison. He didn't really want to be there. Even though he kind of ran it, he still didn't want to be there. But they forgot their promise. The butler and the baker were released. God didn't bring him out immediately. It wasn't until the Pharaoh had a dream a few years later that, that baker, the butler remembered, oh yeah, that's right, there was a, this young kid in prison <laughs> that, that interpreted my dreams. And, and he hung, was hung and I was brought back, just like he said. So, finally, Joseph, because of that dream, interpreted the dream. And Pharaoh saw the wisdom, and God, I'm sure, directed him to. Who's wiser than someone who knows the future, and knows what this means? So Joseph was put 
into something that he had been prepared for all of his life and didn't know it. To be at the right hand of Pharaoh. Preparation for what God had in store for him. And it was God who loved Joseph. And Joseph, I'm sure, wondering during all these calamities, what in the world are you doing, God? <laughs> Why am I where I am? Have you ever felt that way? I have a number of times. I heard Mr. Armstrong in prayer ask God why about something in the work and events of the church. We all do that because we all want to know. You know it's like Daniel, tell me what this is. Yeah, Daniel's not for you to know. That's a lousy answer, isn't it? <laughs> that's not what we want to hear. But that's his business. And if we knew, we'd probably be in trouble. So uh, he's smarter than we are. We don't always know. We just have to have faith that he is preparing something in you and in me that he is working out for some purpose. Again, one in eight billion. Something God had, he knows about you that's useful, that's helpful in the future. It wasn't until God had brought the famine on the earth that the dreams of Joseph that he had with his brothers would come true. Dreams that made his brothers hate him. Genesis 50. Let's go to Genesis 50 and see a little bit more of this. Because the brothers, of course, the famine was there. Joseph sent them down with some money to buy food. The only place that had food was, was Egypt. And the Pharaoh ended up loaning all the land because no one had food. Genesis 50, verse 18. His brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we are your servants. <clears throat> this is right after he had told them who he was. They were sure he was going to kill them. I mean, they would have killed him if it had been reversed, I'm sure. They already tried to kill him once and, and sold him to slavery. So they were sure. But he says to them, Fear not. Am I in the place of God? He recognized that God does things not us. But as for you, verse 20, you thought evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it to pass as it is this very day to save much people alive. He didn't hold the grudge. If you read the story, of course, the brothers thought he held a grudge still. When Joseph, when Jacob died, they thought, man, he's going to kill us now because he didn't want, us to, he just didn't want his father to know he killed us all. <laughs> so, but he didn't. They still... And, and that's what happens when you do things wrong. You get paranoid. Paranoia. There's nothing worse than, than waiting to find out what the punishment is going to be. <laughs> but God forgives. I think I've read this verse many, many times during the dark periods of my life or dark periods of times in the church. There have been a lot of things that have happened. And interesting, the closer you are to the top, the more things God seems to work out and the more people want to be in charge and the more people or after money or whatever, power or whatever. And if you're honest and you're not seeking those things, you often get in the way of the people that do. But I always look at it like Joseph. God, you're doing something here. I could tell stories all day. After one person tried to take over, I was exiled for a month. My life was threatened. Mr. Armstrong calls me up and says, Aaron, leave town immediately. Life's been threatened. I jump motels for over a month. Most people don't know that in the church. <laughs> but uh, same, same stories, same people, same motives, same things. It happens. So many events like that. But again, verses like this take you through. Because if someone means something for evil, God means it for good. And you have to think that way. But what about this prophecy of slavery? 400 years Verse 21, continuing, Now therefore fear not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. And then he moved them all to the best part of Egypt, Goshen. Water, grazing grounds for the, everything, with their brother who is the most powerful man under the Pharaoh. The people of Israel had to feel really good at this point. Given the best land, life was good. And they multiplied. That part of the prophecy is coming true. And they're very wealthy because they have the best part of the land. 
and have the inheritance of Jacob, who was wealthy, and Isaac and Abraham, and their brother, obviously. And yet, there was that prophecy in Genesis 15, 13 that said they would be slaves in a foreign nation. Now it's over 200 years before that prophecy was made, and, and they're living it up and having plenty of wealth and food. And then all of a sudden, a pharaoh comes up who knew not Joseph, and they're put into slavery. It finally comes true, this prophecy that would seem like it wouldn't happen. Those favored were now cursed. The wealthiest, the most powerful nation in the world now dominated their lives, even to the point of killing their babies. How would they be delivered from this? The prophecy did say they'd come out with a high hand and much wealth. But how would that happen? Egypt's armies can take over all the world. God was in charge as always, again, without giving anyone the details. And the preparation that was going to come. God speaks of knowing people from the womb. In Isaiah 49, verse 1, keep your finger where you are, until you end up going back to Exodus. In Isaiah 49, verse 1, God says, Listen, O islands, to me, and hearken, you people from afar off, the Lord has called me from the womb. From the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. Verse 5 again, And now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob again to him. Though Israel is not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. Again, to glorify God. That's why this happens. Jeremiah also, chapter 1, talks about God knowing him from the womb. Jeremiah 1, verse 4 the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I was formed, you before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. Before you came forth out of the womb, I sanctified you, and I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Wow. How many of us did God know? I mean, did he pick the sperm? I always the old joke of yeah, a million sperms, and that's the fastest one, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh I think he knows a lot more about us starting earlier than we ever think he did in our lives. We can never do that. Jeremiah, of course, says, but Lord God, I'm only a child. That's his answer. And again, I said that too. I told Mr. Armstrong, a lot of other men around here have been around a lot longer. Let them do the job. No, no, he wanted me. But, uh, and I did go through a lot of trouble. I, I knew it couldn't be done, and I was right. But uh, <laughs> God can do it. That's how it works. You don't know how it's going to happen. You don't know what God's doing in your life. People always ask me, how did I end up on the plane? I said, I, uh, there are so many things in my life he did that I look back on now. Even my father's death. My mom came into the church, or was coming into the church. She didn't even know Aaron was in the Bible when she named me. <laughs> so that was after that, she started listening to Mr. Armstrong and got excited about it. My, my, my dad wasn't excited at all. He uh, really didn't care about it. He, he liked sports and athletics. He was... He was good. He's actually asked to play for the Minneapolis Lakers. That's the L.A. Lakers now. And uh, but he didn't because Link Belt, uh, as a supervisor, he made more money with the construction company. <laughs> they didn't pay people a lot back then for sports. But it was interesting because he had a stroke and he was supposed to die. Actually, my mom got disowned by the dean's side of the family. There were four other brothers and a sister. And uh, so I, my grandfather, lived to be 98 years old, and I never saw him the time I was three years old on, which is sad. I wish I could have. But it's interesting because uh, he had the stroke. He was supposed to die. My mom was praying for him, and the family made fun of her for his crazy religion, and, and the doctor said he's going to die, and all of a sudden he's healed. He gets well, and he goes back to work, and then a year and a half later he gets killed in a construction accident. Well, you wonder why. I mean, it gave my mom great faith. Then all of a sudden... He's killed. And it wasn't even they had a trial because it was a murder trial because he was crushed by a runaway crane. Now those cranes with the big balls, they go about three miles an hour under power. So they don't really know what happened. They couldn't prove anything, but but everything about him, all the pictures, everything ended up in that warehouse where the Indiana Jones has the ark. <laughs> because mm -hmm. I hardly have anything from him. I hear stories about him. But because of that, 
Mr. Blackwell did the funeral and told my mom, you know, go down to Big Sandy where the widows are. So if he hadn't died, I'd have probably been to sports and all sorts of things. And instead, I'm down there with the widows in Big Sandy where I met all the, the named people in Big Sandy. And then uh, four years later, my mom moves to Pasadena. I go to school with all the evangelist kids and all the people that were in positions, or positions I needed to know later with Mr. Armstrong, but I didn't know that. I just was a kid. But I had 12 years of imperial, which meant I studied the Bible every day of my life. And then I went to college, Big Sandy, for a year and a half, met Michelle, and uh, managed to get her to like me enough that she would wait for me. <laughs> and then I went to Pasadena. But in Big Sandy, because I had 12 years of imperial, I'd had all the Bible classes already because the assistants of the college taught in Imperial. So I didn't have to study, so I went in the kitchen, and the two people in the kitchen, Ron and Rick Hoffman, came from the School of Culinary Arts in Denver. And so I went in and asked him at night. I had a day job, one of the only two freshmen that had a day job with the warehouse delivering mail and stuff. And I went in and asked, hey, can I learn to cook? Because we had 15 men's clubs and 15 women clubs. And every semester you had a men's night, and a ladies' night. So I, there would be 30 dinners a semester. And then we had French club, Spanish club, and German club as well. So I learned how to do Tassar Broughton and, and uh, all the things there, <laughs> Flaming Cherry's Jubilee and Fitzgerald and, and Caesar salad from scratch with anchovy oil and the actual anchovies and the whole package. And uh, never had a, never had a <laughs> recipe. And so I was here, taste that, taste this, taste that, and just throwing stuff in. And so, uh, so I learned to cook. Went to Pasadena, didn't do any cooking out there. There were some events happened in Big Sandy that shouldn't have happened. Again, another trauma, similar to the ones we read about. So I, I went to Pasadena. And uh, in Pasadena, I, uh, on graduation day, I was supposed to go to Salt Lake City as a trainee, which I didn't expect because I wasn't planning in that direction, didn't expect that at all. But it was graduation day that Mr. Armstrong called and asked me to fly with him. And the phone rang during the brunch, and he said, uh, do you know who this is? I said, yes, sir. I felt like asking you know who I am, but he'd asked for me, so. so. <laughs> and I thought I was in real trouble, which I actually was. I didn't know it. But uh, I said, well, I was supposed to leave Sunday to go to Salt Lake City. He said, they'll understand. On Monday morning at 8 o'clock, we left for Europe. My first dignitary I served was England to Russell. I served King Leopold and Princess Lillian. And uh, then Went down to Jordan, I served Princess Sam, Crown Princess Sam and family, and then, you know, I mean, throwing other stuff. And one thing I learned real quick was the fact that water doesn't boil at 212 degrees at <laughs> that altitude, so some things don't cook quite the same. <laughs> so, I mean, I had, I had some fun, and they didn't give me butter, but I had English cream, and I shook it and made my own butter to serve. <laughs> so my grandmother taught me that. But he asked me to fly because Mr. Armstrong wanted a college graduate, and he wanted someone to cook. How many ambassador graduates know how to cook? <laughs> so I mean I was kind of the lone wolf I guess and uh, but I didn't I mean I learned to cook because I ate really good <laughs> a lot better than going through the line but uh, that's how I ended up with it but you know, how much of this did God do I, you know you don't know I mean time and chance that but when all these dominoes fall one direction you, you gotta wonder what God has in store for you <clears throat> Jeremiah didn't have aspirations for himself I'm a child I don't want to do this and in an evil generation, I guess you're smart to think that way because if you try to be righteous in this world, you're going to get beat up. You're going to be chewed out. You'll be mocked. But God doesn't do things randomly. God knows you. And he knows what he has in store for you and what lessons you'll need to have to train you. When did he start? Maybe before you were born. I don't know. It didn't start with Crystal shivering in the water, I can guarantee that. It started with her a couple years earlier when I taught her to swim. Let's continue with Israel's story in Exodus 2. Interesting things here in Exodus. Again, God doesn't tell us everything. Do you think Moses was a random baby? The timing was right now for that 400-year prophecy that they would come out with a high hand. Exodus 2 and verse 1. There went a man of the house of Levi and took a wife, a daughter of Levi. The woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him, that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. God seemed to be involved even in what Moses looked like. 
like to read something from Josephus. This is something that uh, was written by Jared Calloway. Now, his credentials, he's a PhD in religion from Columbia University, visiting assistant professor at Illinois College, taught at the University of Mississippi, University of Illinois, and the Wesleyan University, Columbia University, and his research focuses on the New Testament and emergent Christian interactions with ancient Judaism in their Greco-Roman and ancient Near Eastern environments. That's a lot of credentials. He writes this, During my pursuit of ancient quirks, I want to discuss the strange first century interest in Moses' beauty. I have discussed it in Hebrews 11 and Acts 7, in Philo of Alexandria's recounting it, and now other prominent first century Jewish writers, such as Josephus. Josephus picks up on this broader first century promotion of this fine physique of Moses, but there are some major alterations and expansions. To recap, previous traditions directed relate Moses' beauty at birth as the reason why his parents, particularly his mother, decided to save him from infanticide. Although Acts 7.20 merely notes that Moses at verse was beautiful before God, Hebrews 11.23 reasons that by faith Moses, when he was born, was hid for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful. Both build upon the reasoning found in the Septuagint, Exodus 2.2, seeing that he, Moses, was a beautiful, they sheltered, covered him for three months. Philo readily exploits this rendering of Moses. He uses it energetically to explain why his parents saved him and other parents did no such thing, and why Pharaoh's daughter took an instant liking to him. It all came down to his beauty. Now tell me, if you're a princess and you see a baby floating by and it's ugly, <laughs> would you pick it up and adopt it? It would seem that God was even involved in the genetics of Moses, because here's this baby that was beautiful, and Pharaoh's daughter sees it and kind of falls in love with it instantly and raises it in Pharaoh's house. So Exodus verse 3, you're still there. When she could no longer hide him, she took him from the ark of bulrushes, daubed it with slime and wild with pitch, and put the child therein, and laid it in the flags by the river's brink. And his sister stood afar off to wit, to see what would be done to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along by the river's side. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. Again, did God put it in her mind to come down at that time, all this? When she opened it, she saw the child. Behold, the baby wept, and she had compassion on him, and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse of the Hebrew woman, that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. She knew who it was. Of course, Pharaoh's daughter couldn't produce milk, and so... She had a nursemaid, mother. How would you like to nursemaid your child and somebody else's, as somebody else's child? It had to be hard. He was a goodly child. She loved him. So did Pharaoh's daughter. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away, nurse it for me, and I'll give you wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. The child grew, and she brought him into Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She called his name Moses. She said, Because I drew him out of the water. God not only saved Moses, but put him in a position preparing him for the largest organized movement of people in history. I mean, this is mass refugees. We have refugees to talk about now. This is mass refugees, okay? What was his preparation? Acts 7, verse 22, I'm just going to read the verse so you don't need to turn to it, you can write it down. It says, And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and was mighty in words and deeds. So he was well educated. <coughs> There's a great deal of time in Exodus between verses 10 and verses 11. And at times when he slays the Egyptian. It's interesting, we look at Numbers, though, 12 1. After Moses had become a man, I'd like to read something. He was first in the wisdom of the Egyptians, but here's a little bit of the story that. I always wondered about until I read Josephus. I actually read Josephus when I was 12 years old, which is not a normal book for kids that age. But they kept saying a lot. Of, they kept talking about him in Bible classes. So I finally, my dad had a copy, and so I, I read it. It was a little bit beyond me, but it was kind of fun. Uh, after Moses became a man, Numbers 12:1 says he married an Ethiopian woman. 
Verse 1 says, Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. Now we do know he married Jethro's daughter. <laughs> so where did this woman come in from? And why is she there? Now it doesn't say he didn't have an Ethiopian wife. It does, I mean, so obviously he had married one. The Bible doesn't say how they met. But Josephus in the Antiquities of Jews, we read this. When Moses reached manhood, there was a great battle fought between the forces of Egypt and Ethiopia. Moses, in his first battle, made a surprise attack on the Ethiopians, and they were defeated. They began to flee Egypt while Moses followed them all the way back to their own country in order to engage them in battle. In the end, they retreated to Saba, the capital of Ethiopia. When Moses had punished the Ethiopians, he celebrated his marriage to Tharbas, the king of Ethiopia's daughter who had fallen in love with Moses and had asked to give herself as a prize to Moses to stop the war. Now, if you are being attacked and the prince of Egypt is going to be there and you're going to marry him, that's pretty good status, isn't it? I mean, your country's going to be vassals, which is fine, you're a princess there anyway, but now you're going to be princess for the people that conquered you. Wow, great thing. It's interesting. It goes on, this is a, the other guy writing, For many years, modern historians laughed at the idea of Ethiopia, that it could have been strong enough to attack and conquer part of Egypt. But in 2003, an ancient inscription was found on a tomb in El Cap, dealing with a massive invasion of Egypt from the combined armies of Cush, along with its allies from neighboring lands. Many cities along the Nile were indeed ransacked by Ethiopians for their treasures. Kind of matches what Moses and why he married her and the whole thing. Again, it's not in the Bible, but I, it, it's interesting to me because I've always wondered about the Ethiopian woman. And what's interesting to me, too, is Moses, we're going to read next, how he killed the Egyptian. He leaves the country in exile. What happens to your status as a wife and princess when your husband's accused of murder and has to flee? Your status kind of goes down a lot. Now when he comes back and rescues and destroys Egypt and leaves again, he's got status again and she shows up, wouldn't you? <laughs> and that's what Miriam and Aaron are talking about. Interesting take, I mean something we don't think about, but but uh, obviously she was kind of in disgrace and all of a sudden she's come back to the top. Okay, here we go. Exodus 2.11, we're going back there. The oppression of Israel, Moses saw and he killed the Egyptian and he had to flee. He probably thought his role at this time was going to be over in Egypt. Verse 11, He came to pass in those days, Moses was grown, he went out to his brethren, looked at their burdens, he spied an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren. He looked this way and that way, and when he saw that there was nobody looking, he slew the Egyptian and ate him in the sand. Yeah, this guy, take care of that. Nobody's watching. When he went out the second day, behold, two of the Hebrews strove together, and he said to him that did wrong, Why are you hitting your fellow? And he said, Who made you a prince to judge us? Do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Uh-oh, <laughs> somebody was watching. Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. What moved them to do this? What moved them to say this? Did God create this situation? Now Pharaoh heard this thing. He sought to slay Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. And we have the story of Jethro's daughters, etc. Again, Moses didn't know what he was being prepared for. He didn't know God made him pretty. He didn't know that God put him over with the armies, that God taught him the wisdom. He knew he knew that, but he didn't know that God was behind it. Now, for the next 40 years, he was going to learn about God by being a simple shepherd. He never planned anything more than that. But it was different. Hebrews 11, verse 24 through 27. We read about Moses in the faith chapter. It's interesting what it says because he had it all. Hebrews 11, verse 24. By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Sin is pleasurable. He esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, 
not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. The burning bush. When the time came in his life when he was confronted with the choice between pleasures, wisdom, prestige, power of Egypt, over the armies, and choosing God's people, he chose the identity of the people of God. This was Ruth when she told Naomi, your people are my people, your God is my God. Obviously there was going to be great self-denial and suffering with the choice he was making because we go through those things. God puts us through many events. Moses had to think his days were over. He, he wouldn't need his army training now. I'm running sheep. <laughs> you know, give me a dog. That's all I need. <laughs> <laughs> but not so. We read what happened, verse 16 of Exodus 2. The priest and Bidia had seven daughters. They came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. And the shepherds came and drove them away. And Moses stood up and helped them and watered the flock. And we all remember Charlton Heston doing that in the movie. <laughs> and when they came to Reuel, their father, he said, How is it that you are come so soon today? Verse 19, they said, An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and drew water for us and watered the flock. He said, Where is he? Why is it that you have left the man? And he helps you out and you run off. Okay? Call him that he can eat with us. And Moses was content to dwell with the man, and he gave Moses Zipporah, his daughter. Moses probably thought this was the only wife he was going to have from then on. Wasn't planning on going back and finding his other wife, which joined them at the Exodus. But Moses was thoroughly trained. But he wasn't being trained for war, God was training him to organize Israel and to lead them out of Egypt. He didn't know this role till he saw the burning bush at age 80. At age 80, he got a glimpse <laughs> of what was going to happen and what God told him to do. Forty years after fleeing Egypt, now he had been prepped for this task, trained in Pharaoh's house, trained in managing the army, the greatest army in the world at the time, and humble, being a shepherd for 40 years, none of which he could have imagined at any point earlier in his life. Why did he say no to God when I can't talk, I can't do this? He was going to face the biggest army in the world, the army that he had led. And he's going to walk back there as a shepherd and tell him, let my people go, <laughs> you know, fight them off. I mean, he was probably thinking that God's going to have some kind of war here or something. And I know what that army's like. Be like, tell me one of you, go, hey, we're going to go out here and fight the American army. Yeah, right. <laughs> he had to wonder. I'd be nervous too. But God was doing it. And he had been prepared, really. Turn to Philippians 1, verse 6. God knows. He knew what Moses needed for preparation, just as he knows what you need for your preparation. Maybe a one-time job, maybe a lifelong event. Am I surprised how many people in the work want to be Joshua and take over the work? Nobody seems to want to be Caleb. Caleb went in, he gave a good report, and he able to live his life out and enjoy his family. Joshua got all the headaches. Too many people want to be Joshua. But again, it may be a one-time job, maybe a lifelong event. Philippians 1, 6, though, makes it very clear. Being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He'll perform it until you're ready for that first resurrection to take your place in the millennium. When did God begin his work in you? You don't really know exactly how or when. You think back and you see little things here and there. But you don't know. I had prepped Crystal. Taught her to swim. Standing on my skis. Letting her fall. Holding her tight. And I told her, don't let go. So after I told her she'd be out here all day, unless she did it, I told Michelle, hit it. She lifted up out of the water. Of course, hit it. Only meant to get out of neutral. <laughs> and she stood up on the water. And she held on. And she skied all the way around the lake without falling. She just didn't know she could do it. She didn't know she was prepared for it. But she was. It wasn't just skill, although some skill. It was the preparation that she had had before 
and are letting go of her fear. Your fear you can let go. It's your job and your assignment. You can't. You have to let go of fear and trust God implicitly. Preparation is not always easy. It wasn't for Joseph. It wasn't for Moses. And you may not even know that you're being prepared. You may have had things happen before you were baptized that were preparation. You didn't know. Moses certainly didn't know what was in store for him. Joseph had his dreams, but he didn't know how that was going to come to pass. Abraham was never told more than that one line. That you're, they're going to be slaves and they're going to come out rich. Nothing more. They were all wealthy until they became slaves. No one could have predicted that either. Preparation is not always easy. But God puts choices before you to help prepare you. And he knows what he's doing. We have an ABC class now about halfway through the year. I started the year by telling them God moved them somehow to apply. He had something in store for them. Something they could learn. Something that would help them in their future. They may not know what it is. Was it chance that you're here? Or they came to ABC or others? God says he calls us, so it wasn't chance. He called you. God has plans for each of us. Our skill sets are all different. Our personalities are different. The things God puts us through are different. But we all live in the same world, Satan's world, with all of its problems and all of its trials. And they'll be magnified at the end time. So you near the great tribulation, it's going to get worse. And it will be difficult. Turn to John 17. You see these ministers on TV with the health wealth gospel. And they... If you read the words of Christ, you can't think about a health wealth gospel. Because when you tell the truth and everything goes wonderful, no. Sometimes you're killed for it. Sometimes you're sent in exile for it. The truth doesn't always mean that you will be delivered at that moment. John 17, verse 14. I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray that you should take them, not take them out of the world, but you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even if I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. God, open your minds through the word, the scriptures, to see that. And you have sent me into the world, even so have I sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. That's you. That's me. Those few that God has called over 6,000 years out of the billions of people that are alive now and the billions that have been alive adding up from Adam to the end. You live in a world that values winning over character. I'm always so upset at these game shows. It's about lie, cheat, and steal to win. Whether there's politics, sports, whatever. So many of those things. They value winning over character. A world that values outer beauty over inner beauty. A world that values accumulating wealth over giving and service to others. But we have to be like Christ. Because this world's values are about to end. And a new set of values are coming. What is important now is character. Character, character. Talk about the three things of real estate. Location, location, location. Well, the three things of Christianity. Character, character, character. Knowing what's right and doing what's right. God has prepped you in a way that you don't even know. You can look back at some events here and there, perhaps pieces of it but you don't know but like with Abraham as you go through your life can you finish your life with God saying now I know as he did Abraham now I know that you will do my way to perform the actions that I taught help others serve give throughout your eight stages you heard of in the sermonette all the way through not necessarily knowing what each stage means 
until you look back at the end. And then when Christ returns, we'll probably have other chores, but it'd be nice to sit down and ask, which of those things did you do? <laughs> which did I do? It'd be fun to ask. But it's going to mean doing what is hard over what is easy. It's going to mean choosing right over wrong. It's going to mean choosing the truth over the lies of human reason. That's what God has called you to. It means faith and trust that you are being prepared for something bigger than you know. Moses didn't know he was being prepared for something special until he saw the burning bush. Joseph didn't know why until he saved his father's people from starvation. God meant it for good, even when others mean it for evil. God gives you opportunities to prove him, to find out where you stand, so he can say, now I know. Have faith. Don't fear. And most of all, don't let go.